Okay, oh Lord. Um, I'm just waiting for this live stream thing to work. Got it. Got it, okay. So, um, good, okay. Welcome everyone to tonight's program. We're delighted to have with us um, historian, Dr. Terry Dunn, who has a PhD from the sociology department in uh, or from Maynooth University at home in Ireland. He is currently the Leash Historian in Residence and has been for a number of years under the Decade of Centenaries program. And um, his forthcoming and ongoing research is also funded by the Royal Irish Academy at home. He has been published in scholarly journals like ERA or Ireland, uh, say her rural history and as well um, a history Ireland a, a large online um, website and he makes his own research accessible too through his podcast Peelers and Sheep which I would strongly urge you to listen to he is co-editor with John Cunningham from Galway University of an upcoming book Spirit of Revolution Ireland from Below 1917 to 1923 and tonight he's going to talk to us about uh, agrarian political and social movements um, which kind of show how the processes of rural social conflict um, are characterized in Ireland and particularly in that kind of revolutionary era how they change. So welcome uh, Dr. Don. thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to mute myself and take myself out. As always everyone who's online you can ask questions through the Q&A feature and I'll uh, filter them or, or I'll ask them at the end of the presentation. But thank you very much, everyone, and welcome, Dr. Dunn. Thanks to the uh, Irish American Heritage Museum for having me, and thanks for you all um, being here and uh, to listen. Um, now it's 10.30 uh, p.m. my time, and I started the, uh, the morning commute this morning at 5 a.m., so Bear with me, yeah, and I have a fair bit to uh, to get through as well. So now to kind of change to um, what was advertised, I'm going to be talking less about Claire and more about Leash, Meath and Kildare, though Claire will get a mention. Um, and I just want to, as well, to thank Leash Library Services for funding some of the research that's gone into this talk and also the uh, Royal Irish Academy. Uh, I'm going to be making a little documentary short on East Clare and land conflict in East Clare, which is funded by the Royal Irish Academy, so watch out for that. Anyways, I'll get started. On the 25th of February 1920, Peter Rowe of Ballycale, County Tipperary, hears his dogs barking and a rapping on his gate. And this is at half six in the morning, so he's wondering what's going on. And when he went out, out into his yard, there were four or five men there and about 65 cattle and four horses. This was a cattle drive. A group of people had assembled and removed Rose's stock of land he held and returned them to his yard. The point was to force the redistribution of the land. And this was a central tactic of what was known as the Ranch War. And the, the Ranch War had more gone on in 1907, 1908, 1909. Um, but the same tactic was taken up, was resumed and taken up on a large scale um, in 1920. So Roe returns his animals to his farm in Curramore, which is over the border into Leash, so in kind of southwest Leash here, the Leash Tipperary borderland. And then later that afternoon, they were driven again. Um, and driven off again and returned to his to his to his yard. At this time, it was approximately ninety cattle and uh, twenty sheep. And again, a few days later, after he would have returned them, they were driven off yet again. Now, in ninth, this was sort of this sort of protest for the redistribution of farmland was going on in nineteen eighteen, and again in nineteen twenty, and again during the. Um, well, I suppose the 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 the, the period of the the the, the troops and running up to the civil war, um. But we have more kind of images from um the time of the ranch war, and um, so this is just one image from a unionist um publication from depicting what was going on in North Meath in uh, 1908. So there you can see two Royal Irish Constabulary. Um, policemen guarding the uh, the hay harvest, 
Um, and this is a, another picture from the time of the ranch war where um, sometimes these cattle drives would, uh, would, would involve, they'd have bands, yeah, uh, with the assembled crowd. Um, and that woman there, Mrs. McGann, is, um, she has a, 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 a drone captured off the cattle drivers and is trying to, uh, to, to make her cattle used to the sound of the drum so as to make it harder for, um, for the cattle to be driven. Now, to get back to what happened with Peter Rowe and the, the, the incident in Curramore, which is, as I was saying, is, the leash, is in Leash, but close to the Tipperary border, southwest Leash. So because um, that particular episode on the 25th of February, 1920, um, ended up in court, um, we have some of the words of one of the cattle drivers, yeah? So when talking to Peter Rowe on the morning of the 25th of February, 1920, William Bergen, who was one of the cattle drivers, says, I have five acres, you have 500. Between us, between him and his, uh, his, his colleagues in the drive, between us, we have not enough land to sod a lark. Now, I wanted to emphasize this, uh, William Bergen's words, because historical research notwithstanding the great advantages of uh, archaeology and oral history, historical research rests in large part on documentary evidence, on what words people wrote down at the time that we can thereby access decades or centuries later. And the processes of leaving that documentary record are processes shaped by relations of power and inequality. Yeah. So in the 19th century, you might have a source's correspondence between an agent and a landlord, or you might have sources emanating from the state, such as commissions on particular social problems or police records. Uh, you don't get to see anything of what a lot of people were thinking. So that's why these few little words from William Bergen uh, uh, are important. And education is also a factor in this, but um, like the people who are more educated are going to be leaving more records. So you can't really separate education from relations of uh, power and inequality. Now, Formal organizations such as a union or a pressure group or an association can make a difference here because they'll maybe have a newspaper or send statements to the press or have minutes, have meetings and keep minutes. Um, but the cattle drivers in 1918 and 1920, they had no such organization. And um, so their words are comparatively rare. And the main source for them is actually the words of their opponents. Um, so the record is skewed and there's an obvious potential there for later histories to be skewed as well. Now, things are a little different, as we'll see, um, uh, as regards trade unionism among farm workers, because they were organised into formal organisations, especially a formal organisation called the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, and so left us more of a documentary trace for that reason. But we'll, we'll get to them in, in, in a minute. And I should say the cattle drivers, when you're talking about them, we're mostly talking about small farmers. Yeah, it's a movement of small farmers rather than the movement of farm workers. I mean, there was a crossover sometimes. Now, as it happens, as regards the Curramore cattle drive, we have not only William Bergen's words, and there's also actually an account in the uh, Folklore Commission archive, and you remember the um, collection of oral tradition and made, especially made through the national school system in the 1930s. And there's also a local ballad um, recounting the story, which is uh, which is uh, also uh, um, um, not altogether unusual, but uh, but it's it's something that's that's uh, it's it's very precious to to have this um, this record of people, as I say, who don't normally leave a record. Um, one of the interesting things about the local ballad, actually. It lists off all the, the people who were involved in the cattle drive or in the success of cattle drives. And uh, it mentions one of them as being a, um, as having returned from France where he was fighting brave men. I think it's a, it's an interesting, um, so an interesting little aside because we often um, hear that people who came back from the 1914, 1918 war were like forgotten and they came back to an Ireland that was alien to them. Um, but in this instance, we see that, you know, people are referencing this guy's military career um, in the British Army in this local ballad about cattle driving that was uh, sung into the 19, later 1920s and uh, 1930s and 1940s, right? 
But it was only chance that this was recorded um, in the school's collection, not what the Folklore Commission was really looking for. It's not what the Bureau of Military History, which recorded the memories of some of the participants in the Irish Revolution, was looking for either. Because those participants were selected and what they were speaking about was selected as, as well as what people wanted to hear about in the late 1940s and 1950s. Um, and another interesting and significant thing about the Curmore Drive um, on uh, on uh, on uh, Peter Rose land is that the lands were divided up and redistributed before the 1923 Land Act, which carried out a lot of out a lot of redistribution, and that's where you see the Land Commission being revamped um, under that Land Act. Yeah, in the case of um, well, um, 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 according to uh, Professor Terry Dooley's book on the Land Commission, as much as 20% of land in the Irish Free State was redistributed from the 1923 Land Act onwards. And when I say that now, just to be clear, that's land taken from one farm and added to another farm, or new small farms take made out of what was a large holding. Yeah, So that's what I'm talking about here, not just the transfer of formal ownership from landlords to tenants, a redistribution of holdings. Now, as it happened, as I was saying, this process took place in Curramore before the 1923 Land Act. And in June 1920, and um, just a few months after the events of the 25th of February 1920, um, Peter Rowe surrendered um, his lands in Curramore. They were redistributed by a, a, a local um, committee. And uh, interestingly, the same names who show up in court for their involvement um, in the cattle driving also show up as some of the new landholders in the valuation books, as holders of new farms on what had, new farms of about 20 acres on what had been the land held by Peter Rowe. Um, not the only local committee that you, that you see um, doing this, prior to the 1923 Land Act. And this, a lot of this, or the Boris and Ossery area in the southwest of Leash, there seems to have been quite a number of instances where local committees had, had this done before 1923. And, and just to, to give you an, an idea of the sort of land that was particularly um, disputed, yeah, um, well, first of all, you had what was known as untenanted land, right? Now, untenanted land it's kind of a misnomer because it wasn't land that didn't actually have a tenant yeah, as such. Um, but if, if the land was rented out for um, less than a year, for 11 months, and the person renting it didn't count as a tenant and um, legislatively, um, and they had less rights. So landlords had a particular interest in having as much untenanted land as possible and renting that land out. There was a big market for that land, and it was often monopolized by, or would have been seen as being monopolized by wealthy graziers or so-called ranchers, yeah? And so that land was in dispute. And um, this was land that was still in the hands of landlords, yeah? And um, you would have also had, like, out farms, okay, which is what was going on in Peter Rowe's case. It's where someone has a farm in one place, a home farm in one place, and then a second farm somewhere else, yeah? And if that was a large quantity of land, that would have been, at least to the people doing the cattle drive, would have seen, been seen as illegitimate. And also you would have had instances where... Um, there was farms from which people had been evicted in maybe the 1860s or 1870s, and their ancestors were coming back in 1918 or 1920 and, and maintaining that they had a right um, to, uh, to, uh, to those holdings. So this kind of cattle driving went on in 1920, particularly on the East Connacht Plains, so particularly talking about East Galway, was common, South Mayo, yeah. But it would have extended to some extent in, into the North Midlands as well. So we're talking about the kind of, the classic um, beef country, essentially, yeah. And the ranch war in 1907, 1908, 1909 would have kind of 
taken in the same area, the west of Ireland and across into um, uh, North Leinster. Now, it, it, as I say, this sort of thing went on in 1918 and went on a lot in 1920 as well. In 1918, Sinn Féin supported the uh, protests for the redistribution of farmland. Um, and often the, the leading parties would have been Sinn Féin or the volunteers, yeah? Uh, they had switched policy by 1920, and their response in 1920 was the Dahl Courts, yeah? Um, was an attempt to set up a kind of local judiciary and local policing system, which was separate from the, from the one coming from the Crown and was controlled by local Republicans. The Dahl Courts really got going in the summer of 1920, and they were a major part of the Republican counter-state. That's to say, central to the process by which Republicans set up their own parliament, their own policing and judiciary, judiciary tried to set up their own finance department and diplomatic corps, and central another part of that process was local governments, like the local councils transferring their allegiance from the crown to the doll. Yeah. And a big impetus to the doll courts was this movement of cattle driving and an attempt to suppress the movement of cattle driving and kind of keep it under control, yeah? And um, so this, what I'm talking about here and what I'll be talking about um, as we go through the, as we go through um, um, the lecture, it isn't something that's kind of peripheral to the kind of more kind of mainstream narrative of the Irish Revolution, yeah, it's actually, a, 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 I would say it, it, it's a central part, right? So here it's playing a central part in setting, in spurring the set the setting up of, the, uh, of an important institution of the Republican counter-state. And I'd say, in my opinion, I'd argue the Dáil Courts, because they tried to put this kind of dampener on the cattle driving, and played an important role in conciliating an influential sector of Southern Unionists. Now, I remember a lot of Southern Unionists were major landholders because there was still a lot of land to help by landlords. Um, and in that respect, it was an important institution on the road to the treaty. And it also argued that the 1923 Land Act, which we'll be getting to in a bit, which institutionalized the sort of redistribution that went on in the Curramore case, when Curramore was done by a local committee, and that legislation was central, in my opinion, to establishing the Irish Free State, central to uh, to bolstering its legitimacy. Right. So that is as quickly as I could do it. And um, the cattle driving. Yeah. I'm going to go on to a different movement now. I'm going to actually should say this should have said this at the start. I'm going to be looking in this talk as quickly as I can at the cattle at cattle driving at trade unionism among agricultural workers at the Irish Farmers Union, and then looking at how the state responded to some degree to these different movements, yeah? So what we got here now on the slide is the badges of two labor unions, yeah? Um, on one side there, you have the red hand of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union. And um, as we associate, of course, the Irish Transport and General Workers Union mostly with the Great Dublin Lockout of 1913. Um, but this is a different story here, not a story of trams and tenements. And the Irish Transport and General Workers Union actually had a whole other um, life after 1917, um, between 1917 and 1923, when it went from being really in the doldrums um, after 1916, only about 5,000 members to having over 100,000 members a few years later. The majority of them um, were farm workers, which is not that surprising because farm work was the main area of employment, the largest employment sector for male workers in what was to become the Irish Free State, yeah? Um, but as well as the transport union, you had a lot of small little local unions, especially from 1917 onwards, and that's the badge of one of them there, the Mead Labour Union. Now, these would have been rival organisations and eventually the Transport Union kind of took over from the, the Meat Labour Union. But just to get some kind of idea of um, how significant 
um, rural trade unionism was at the time. You just look at the uh, you just look at the election results. Now this is as with the cattle drive, and this is a regionalized phenomenon. But we just look at the election results for the um, for me. Okay, so the June 1922 general election, right? So this is the treaty election, right? Um, in the Louth Mead constituency, 38% of the vote, that's almost two and a half times the quota, uh, went to Cattle O'Shannon of the Labour Party, right? And that's twice as much as its nearest competitor. Um, the percentage of the Labour vote, incidentally, in, in Kildare Wicklow is actually um, larger, yeah? Um, and with both those constituencies, and I'm just using them as an example, but this farm workers' movement was particularly strong in them, Um well, both those constituencies were electing in 1923, the first election after the Civil War, August 1923, they were electing the Labour Party, the Farmers Party, and Cumann and Gale. Yeah. And we get to the Farmers Party, which was the political wing of the Irish Farmers Union, in a minute. Um, and so you see those election results um, and the strength of the Labour Party, and the most the Labour Party at the time wasn't really a conventional political party. The Labour Party as such didn't actually get going until a few years later. And it was pretty much an extension of the trade unions, yeah? And so when you see those results, what you're seeing reflected is the growth of uh, rural trade unionism, which is the big story um, in these years in rural Leinster. Um, it's also a big story in East Munster, I should say, but East Munster had a, had, had, a, had other things going on as well. Um, So, yeah, it went from um, 5,000 members to over 100,000 in the space of a few years. And a crucial episode in that growth was the Mead and Kildare farm strike of July and August 1919. Yeah. Um, I'll just give you a sample of, a, of the newspaper report from a demonstration, uh, from a, a rally in, 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 in Navan um, in July 1919. Navan, the county town of... Uh, of Meath. And this is what the Meath Chronicle um, said of a bit of this demonstration. A county Meath Labour demonstration under the auspices of the IT and GW Union was held in the Fair Green Navan on Sunday last. There was a decent attendance, contingents uh, attending from Drumree, Kilmesson, and other centres. Three red flags bearing the inscription OBU, that's one big union, were carried. Yeah. And one big union is uh, actually a slogan they took from the United States, from the uh, industrial workers of the world, which had some influence on the transport union, and um, which was actually referred to in the um, in the at the rally. Yeah. So one of the speakers said, "If the Mead farmer was alarmed to find his men walking under the red flag with the OBU on its folds, one big union again, it was nothing to the alarm which would be." Um, aroused when he would see the one big union of America and the, and the industrial workers of the world bearing aloft the same flag. Yeah. Um, and it goes on to say Labour was becoming international and then the transport union they had a union that would one day become the one big union of the world. Yeah. And so on the one hand, um, kind of very kind of local and immediate demand for higher wages, for wages to keep um, to keep up with inflation, there was massive inflation, rising food costs um, at the time. But on the other hand, they were aware of being part of a wider um, um, international movement. Yeah. And again, as with the cattle drivers, this is not, I would argue, something that's per peripheral to what we think of as the main story of the Irish Revolution, because this wave of unionization in the countryside is what allowed the general strike against conscription in the spring of 1918 and the general strike in support of hunger strikers and the hunger striking political prisoners in Mount Joy in the spring of 1920, um, which was a, and that general strike in support of the hunger strikers in Mount Joy was a, um, a very significant, um, a, a, a very significant action. Now, and I'll just move on to our third movement, the Irish Farmers Union. Um, that's the Irish Farmers Union uh, represented there as it was depicted by their opponents, I should say, 
Um, but as you can see, the opponents in the workers' movement are again putting them in a international um, context. The uh, fascisti in uh, Italy making the um, the news at the time, and the uh, Ku Klux Klan in the United States um, just undergoing its revival um, as part of the kind of uh, was it the Red Summer, um, and also the, after in the wake of the uh, the film Birth of a Nation in 1915. Um, seems like a kind of over-the-top um, portrayal there, but um, the Irish Farmers Union did actually um, propose to establish a paramilitary wing or an element of the Irish Farmers Union um, did I call the Farmers Freedom Force, and that's what the uh, the cartoon is referring to. Farmers Freedom Force never really got, um, got going, but in industrial disputes on the land at the time, there would have been strong arm um, tactics used. Um, up to and including the use of firearms by both Irish Farmers Union activists and, and Transport Union activists, I should say. Uh, so what was the Irish Farmers Union about? Well, it was in large part an anti-labour organisation. So it would have represented employing farmers in um, wage disputes Anti-labour and other aspects as well. Um, the 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 farmers, the proposed farmers' freedom force was proposed in the context of an embargo made on food exports in the um, spring of nineteen twenty. Yeah, um, it was also in favour of fiscal restraint, except when government spending would benefit them. Um, Big problem was kind of was division over tariff policies because there was a division among farmers as to whether they were barley growers or beef um or beef specialists and barley growers in particular felt they were um their um uh, um voices were not being were not being heard. And there was as we might expect a division along east west lines. The Irish Farmers Union was pretty much strong in kind of Leinster and East Munster on the, on the good land. Um, supported tenant purchase. Uh, so I should say it was a new role for ex-landlords, and I'm going to be getting to that now in a minute. Despite being a new role for ex-landlords, it did support tenant purchase. And one of the things that is often forgotten about the um, about this period is lots of people still have landlords. Yeah. And um, per depending on what part of the country you were in, yeah, but tenant purchase had not finished, yeah. Tenant purchase, the final phase of tenant purchase was under the 1923 Land Act, not under the, under the Land Acts of the British state. And um, so in some counties like Leash and Offaly, you know, you're, it's kind of pushing 50-50 as to if tenants had, uh, had, had purchased their holdings yet. And strangely, although one might think, um, although it was an organisation that tended to represent the interests of larger farmers, it kind of acquiesced in these the the, the whole kind of land redistribution um, program. But one of the interesting things about it, and one thing that I'm particularly interested in, the Irish Farmers Union, is how um, it provided a role, it provided a space for ex-landlords to continue to have a, a civic role, um, an important social and civic role in Irish life. Um, so uh, particularly uh, for one example of them, and this is where I get to County Clare, is this man here who's George O'Callaghan Westrop. Um, and we hear a lot about land, big houses being burned out in this period, um, which... I'm not saying that didn't happen, okay? That's definitely part of the story, right? But this is another, uh, I think, a contrasting story. Um, so this man, George Callahan Westrop, I actually, um, I live um, on what was his estate, so I'm about, um, my house is about two kilometres away from where he's um, where he's sitting there. Um, George Callahan Westrop, I think it's fair to say if you were going to pick two... If you were going to pick the notorious landlords of County Clare, yeah, his family probably would have came in um, second, okay, um, after the Vandaliers. Uh, there were no, their kind of notoriety um, stems from the Bodike evictions, 
which was uh, evictions during the um, uh, planner campaign, um, in the which was a series of rent strikes around about 1890. And so the competition for notoriety would be between the O'Callaghan's and the Vandaliers. The Vandaliers also evicted a lot of people um, off their land in the, uh, during the planet campaign. The Vandaliers were also known for evicting people off their land in uh, during the famine. Um, he was also the uh, one of the leading unionist um, activists in, uh, in, 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 in County Clare. And he was also a former British Army officer. Um, was well, expected to be referred to by his British Army title um, into the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. And despite this, he is also president of the Irish Farmers Union for County Clare. And as a matter of fact, he is not the only person um, of an ex-landlord background or a former British Army background in this position, right? And the Irish Farmers Union was not a marginal organisation. It was the main representative organisation of Irish farmers in this period, had tens of thousands of members. So I just think the role that um, he was able to play um, and others like him were able to play in this period is actually, I think it maybe shows a past which is more pluralistic than um, than, than, than some ways that sometimes this, uh, this, uh, this uh, period is uh, presented. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about how the state responded um, to these various movements and, 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 and this unrest, right? And um, so the major legislative act of the new Irish Free State was the 1923 Land Act, right? Now, what that did was it finished off the tenant purchase, right? It supercharged the process of land redistribution, which had already started on a smaller scale um, under the British state, right? And what you see really in the period is this kind of interrelationship of agitation and legislation, yeah? So um, I think people, I think every time there was a reform um, or a concession, um, it, it, it often had the effect of, uh, uh, of um, showing people that, uh, that um, they could, showing people what they could get, let's put it that way, yeah. And so that was, one, so this 1923 Land Act was one kind of way the, the new state attempted to win consent and um, attempted to uh, to assuage this some of this rural discontent, okay? Um, and another um, interesting way is not to supporting land redistribution, but trying to support production on small farms and make small farms more viable, yeah? And one of the means of doing that was the county committees of agriculture, okay? The county committees of agriculture were like, these are like the extension programs you have in the United States, but in the United States, they're through universities, as I understand it. And the county committees of agriculture were a part of local government, but also affiliated with the Department of Agriculture, yeah? But Ireland already had a Department of Agriculture that was like the Irish Department of Agriculture dates from um, um, 1899, if I remember right, right? So it predates the state. Um, and the interesting thing about a lot of the work of the County Committees of Agriculture is it's not necessarily supporting or it has a focus on supporting um aspects of agricultural production that you might not necessarily expect, okay? There's a big focus on poultry. There's a big focus on pigs. There's a surprising focus on horticulture. And, and a lot of this is the types of production that can be carried out in a small farm, yeah? Because this is before... Um, 
poultry production and pig production has been centralized into the big battery farms that we think of now. Yet this hasn't happened yet. This is coming down the road in the 20th, later in the 20th century. People didn't, didn't necessarily know it was going to happen, right? And also supported on farm butter making, yeah. Um, and this is more of a thing. And um, a lot of butter was still at this stage produced in the in the farm kitchen um, and bought up by dealers. Yeah. Now this is in the outside the dairy heartland. The dairy heartland at this stage, you would have had the creamery movement. Okay. But this the county committees of agriculture are trying to make on farm butter making up to a you know a, 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 an improved standard yeah and this is all a way of, ma of making and uh, trying to make small farms more viable as well as expanding their acreage with the land redistribution also trying to trying to uh, improve production right so that's um The kind of consent aspect of what the new state is doing. There's also a coercion aspect, and um, and that coercion aspect, I guess, is is uh, typified by the Special Infantry Corps. Okay, the Special Infantry Corps was a specific unit of the new army of the new state, which was. whose remit was dealing with agrarian unrest and labor unrest, yeah. And um, so what that was used to do was in instances where farms had been taken over the Peter Rowe scenario that I, that, I, that I started the talk with, the Special Infantry Corps would come in, would seize the stock the stock of the cattle drivers or the stock of the people who had driven the cattle in 1920 but were now in possession of the land in 1923 would seize that, those stock and transport them to urban areas and auction them off, okay, to stop people from doing this um, cattle driving um, stuff, uh, cattle driving activity. That was one kind of aspect of the Special Infantry Corps. Another aspect was where you talk about the rural trade unionism, what areas which were affected by strikes, and particularly in 1923, that's Waterford, um, South Kildare, and along the Kilkenny, Kilkenny Tipperary border. Yeah. So those areas would have been um, put effectively under military occupation by the Special Infantry Corps. And it's like, as one um, historian of Watford puts it, or I think he's transmitting um, um, what was uh, what was uh, told him and the, uh, the Pat McCarthy, I think it is, the author of um, the uh, Four Courts series, um, the Four Courts series, county series book, The Waterford and the Irish Revolution. And um, as he puts it, in Waterford, there were two civil wars, okay? There was the civil war, anti-treaty, pro-treaty, but there was also this labour farmer civil war, yeah? And the Special Infantry Corps came into that scenario. Um, I've been at it, I think, for 40 minutes, so I'm going to wrap up now, so we'll have time for questions and um, comments. Um, but just before I do, to get in a plug, um, the book there, edited volume, coming out with contributors with little case studies or big case studies um, on lots of local areas across Ireland and in many cases dealing with the some of the stuff I've been talking about. And this evening, that should be out in February, March, around about that time next year um, with Four Courts Press. It's hard back and an accessibly priced paperback. So make sure to check that out when it comes out. And also, please check out my podcast, Peers and Sheep, which you will find on Spotify and Google Podcasts and Apple Podcasts and wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and I'm um, very um, uh, open to 
getting questions and comments and looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, I have to unmute myself. So I, that was fascinating, Terry, but I have to admit, this is a subject I know very, very little about, and I'm not sure about our own members. Um, if you want to, you can stop sharing the screen now. Um, so uh, would you mind taking us back a step um, and explaining, there had obviously been a series of land acts under the British, uh, you know, starting in around 1870 to try to allow tenants to buy back or to buy their farms um yeah and then you know this was probably kind of brought on by not only the famine and the kind of the encumbered estates act and all of this but land agitation which had in increased so by the time you were talking which is roughly by the time of you know 1919 or the war of independence a good deal of the we call the middling farmers like might have taken advantage of those several land acts. But then you said it hadn't been finished. So th this 1923 act, which came about after the Civil War had finished, um, that kind of does that finalize a lot of the process of land ownership going from, you know, being just tenants on the land to be to Irish people being owners of the, the farms. And um, yeah, well, the big Land Act for tenant purchase was the Wyndham Act in, if I remember rightly, 1903. Yeah. yeah. Um, but a lot of Irish farmers were still tenants. Okay. Right up into this period, yeah. So in, say, Leash and Offaly, it was about 50-50, right? I mean... The majority of tenants had purchased their holdings, but it was a bare majority, like 52% or 53% in those particular counties. And this is the case um, in the kind of Midlands, North Leinster, right? But the thing is, for your man that I was talking about there in the cattle drive, um, oh, William Bergen. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Roe was the, was, the, was the original owner. William Bergen was the was the, the cattle driver who said to Peter Rowe, um, you have 500 acres and I have only five. And mm -hmm. um, being the owner, I don't know if he was the owner or not, of five acres um, didn't really amount to much because that wasn't uh, what was known as the time at the time as an economic holding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this was a conflict between, in this instance, it was a conflict between um, two sets of people who both had been tenant farmers. And okay. um, Roe had bought out, bought his property under one of the tenant purchase acts. Yeah. So for a lot of people, particularly in what were known as the congested districts yeah. um, along the Western seaboard, yeah, becoming the owner of their becoming having the formal ownership over their farm didn't make that much of a difference if it was 10 acres or 15 acres of rock and bog that wasn't going to be sustaining uh, a lot that they weren't going to be able to sustain a livelihood out of it. And yeah. this is in a context as well, you have to remember the only like outside the northeast, um, and maybe a little bit in Louth, um Dublin, the only industry was agriculture. Yeah. And um, so if you didn't have that land, um, and especially as well in the beef producing areas as opposed to the tillage areas that there wasn't much agricultural employment, if you didn't have that land, you were going to be heading to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but when you had the First World War, um, a lot of that emigration um, ceased, yeah? So you had this kind of um, uh, you, had a, you had a population there that with, with small holdings yeah. impoverished and were staying at home because of the war so they were able to see that there were these large still these large ranches of land the mm -hmm. better land and that's what they that's what they were after, yeah? And mm -hmm. um, and so the 1923, yeah, sorry, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, is that exacerbated then on the other end after the Civil War, like when there is a, a sort of a 
drain, we'll call it, of Anglo-Irish or Protestant landlords, you know, like that final kind of nail in the coffin is when they, some of them decide to leave. So there are potentially pockets of bigger land coming up, you know, yeah. in history. Yeah, well, it often didn't necessarily involve landlords, but it, then it did involve landlords in that um, often those domain farms mm -hmm. um, which they held would have been some of the best land. And um, also what I, I said about the untenanted land, yeah? yeah. And the so-called untenanted land meant that former landlords or former landlords would have held, held a... Um, still had large tracts of land. So um, where I was there talking about O'Callaghan, um, George O'Callaghan Westrop being um, one leader of the uh, County Clare Unionist Club. Um, mm -hmm. Another leader was uh, McNamara um, over more towards uh, Ennis Tymon and Doolin direction. Yeah, mm -hmm. so his lands had be, were taken over and not taken over by the state until... I think 1925 or 1926, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and that process I was talking about, where the 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 state has to come in and retake the land, mm -hmm. um, happened in the, on 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 mm -hmm. on lands, so yeah. Uh, okay, so one of our members, um, God, where did I put it? Asked a question, and this is not a simple, I'd say, an answer. Um, she said, "Where is the best land in Ireland?" My mother used to say, "My father's family in Leash had good land." especially compared to her family's Roscommon bog land holding. And I suppose like the kind of short answer is it kind of depends on what you were farming. You know, we have the Golden Vale, but there's great land in parts of Kerry. There's great land in other parts of the country too, you know. I, I would I would say that Leash probably, ha probably has, what's, what's the right word for it? The widest... Mm. Uh, I can't think of the, 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 the exact phrase because it's uh, 20 past 11, but the mm -hmm. widest um, possible different land uses, okay? Oh, okay, uh, yeah. So diversity, they, they have they, crops and... They, yeah. Exactly, right? Mm -hmm. um, like parts of Tipperary are beautiful, all that golden veil. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. Well, you see, these, these types... The, the land redistribution protests, they okay. tended to be more in areas where um, there were beef, beef production areas, okay? okay. Because the, you could have a great big ranch of land, right? Uh -huh. You could be buying in cattle at the start of the year selling them off at the end of the year. You didn't have to employ a lot of people, okay? Mm -hmm. You didn't have a, necessarily have to have a lot of fixed capital investments, right? And maybe you were just renting that land seasonally and the land was still held by a landlord, mm. okay? And this was all seen um, as having no wider benefit, okay? Mm -hmm. Whereas... This is how it was popularly perceived at the time, okay? Whereas if you've got dairy farming or tillage farming, mm. there is more of an economic spin-off because both of them in these days where there was mechanization, but nothing like the, to the same extent that there is now, mm -hmm. these sorts of farms, the cereal farm or the dairy farm required um labor the required employees right so that's a, a would be seen at the times as, as a spin-off right and um, for the wider society also they required fixed capital investment they required machinery sheds things like that okay mm -hmm. that's also a, a wider spin-off right mm -hmm. whereas a great big ranch of land where there was just a heap of cattle wandering around the place and maybe one herdsman yeah. that was seen as illegitimate because it wasn't. It was one guy monopolizing a, a, a lot of a lot of this resource, and it didn't have any any kind of benefit to the, uh, the wider mm -hmm. society. It was also seen, like it was seen in nationalist terms, as a facet of colonialism. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it was an unprocessed 
a largely unprocessed raw material being exported to England. Yeah, mm -hmm. there was there wasn't the same kind of value added process going on as there was with dairy or cereals, where there was more processing going on in this country and mm -hmm. thereby more value added in this country. That's how it was seen as popularly at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, there's a lot. Sorry. No, Go no, that's good. Um, yeah, so I think that answers Siobhan's question. Lawrence wanted to know how did the land redistribution impact farm workers organizing after 1923? And also what was the political impact of the land distribution in the 20s, 30s and beyond? Yeah, like right. the farming block is such an important voting block, you know, later on. It's it's interesting, yeah. So how it impacted on farm workers? Right. By and large, if you were a farm worker, you did not benefit from this process. Okay. Um because for two reasons. First of all, you weren't a lot of the time, this process wasn't targeted at you, right? Secondly, even if it was, like, even if it was available to you, like, you, like being given the land isn't being given a farm, right? Yeah. Because you need capital to stock it and equip it, right? Which most farm workers wouldn't have had, right? So this was not necessarily a process that was benefiting the poorest and the poor, right? Um. And in some instances, you would have had. So you you would have, but you would have had when large domain farms own tenant land was being broken up. There would have been an agitation to make sure the um, employees got a share of it. Okay, this was particularly. There was a period in the mid nineteen thirties where this was more likely to happen. Right, but there's other instances, as happened in Leash, um, with um, the remainder of the Earl of Port Arlington's estate, which is an emo. You can uh, still go and see the, the um, yeah, the big house. Yeah, the, uh, you can still go and see the splendid uh, big house there. It's uh, uh, owned by OPW now, and um, oh. at, at the time, the um, farm workers there, like they're made redundant because mm -hmm. this property is being taken over. I think it was originally a religious order had the house mm -hmm. and the rest of it was either taken over by the land commission to be redistributed to farmers or the forestry commission for afforestation. They're being made redundant. Yeah. Because you got to remember that a lot of these big domains and whatnot, if it's now when we're talking about the big domains, as opposed to the young towns and land and the ranches, they could employ as farm workers, or as domestic servants and domestic service was the main employment, wage employment sector of women in this period. Mm -hmm. And they could employ an awful lot of people, right? So these guys were made redundant. And what they were actually looking for was not land, yeah, but mm -hmm. to make sure that they would have employment in the new um with the new far with the new forestry service. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um so I mean, yes, some farm workers ended up with land, but by and large it um I would say disadvantaged them. And I would also say that I like as a rule, um there were various measures that existed for farm workers um, under the British state that did not exist under the Irish state. Or if they did exist under the Irish state, it was maybe 20 years after independence. Um how it it panned out in terms of politics. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um it's um okay, it's hard to know because I kind of go up to 1923 and 1924 with this, but I would say from reading Terry Dooley's book on the topic, and he goes more into the um the the the, the free state period after the revolutionary period, um I think delays in the process of land redistribution by his argument contributed a lot to um, Fianna Fáil, mm -hmm. the rise of Fianna Fáil, and then there was a new land act in 1932. Yeah. Um, so there was a continuing discontent there. Mm -hmm. um, also, 
you will constantly see, if you look at the doll record, um, questions from TDs as to when, what's happening with this property, what's happening with that property. And um, if they're lab if they're labor guys, they'll be like, you know, we want to make sure that whoever's uh, working on that property gets their share. Um, that's one thing you see. And another thing you see um, a lot, just on a kind of, I mean, this is, I suppose all politics is local, but this very much manifested itself on a local level. Like, so to be the local TD asking about that property down the road, what you also see is opposition to migration. Yeah. And um, to the, um, now most famously, to where people from the West of Ireland um, are brought to Meath. Yeah. And other parts of Leinster, but especially especially me and and, uh, and North Kildare, and um, and given new farms there, and opposition from me people to that process going on, and this would like you would see we want no more migrants. This land has to go to me people, and so on and so forth in the. Uh, Statements local of local public. politicians, yeah. yeah. And even yeah. like you might get a, pol a politician from the same part, two politicians from the same party, like one from Galway and one from Meath, and them go going uh, hammer and tongs at each other um, over uh, over this issue. I've actually like, um, and most most of this, um, like most of this went on under. And the tricolor, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but some of this land redistribution went on under the union flag as well. It was kind of presaged, shall we say? Yeah. Um, I, I suppose we could say there was a trailer. Um, uh, the 1923 Land Act was the first film, and then the 1932 Act was 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 the sequel. So you do actually, but you do actually see in the revolutionary period as well, and um, the argument that like, okay, we better get out down the road driving those cattle and make sure that we get um, that estate. Because if we don't, next thing you know, it'll be a load of male people or Connemara people will be in there in instead, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you might see that on a county level, but there's also instances within counties and even instances in the next parish over. And you will hear as well, Like there was an old IRA association, and a lot of that old IRA association was um agitating to make sure that we got our share of you know this resource when it was being distributed, but very much on a very much on a local level and very also um difficult to access because the land commission records are still sealed. Oh, interesting then. Yeah. Right. And um Maybe this is part of the, I'd say this kind of local clientelism as regards who was getting what is part mm -hmm. of part of the reason why they are sealed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, and you know, well, people, and people talk about the the um what sort of conservatism I was going to say like of, of the big farmers in Ireland, you know, which are obviously being established maybe from twenty three on, and you know, yeah. um, and that that is a very important block like in Irish society right the way up through the 50s and 60s until kind of Whitaker starts to change uh, with the white paper you know how Ireland's economy is working but I was going to say that coupled with the fact that the civil servants are kind of kept on particularly under common Nguyen like it's, it's the British system with just the common Nguyen government so there isn't a lot of dynamism even within this change and yet on the labour side when you were talking like I was thinking when you mentioned the wobblies and things Jim Narkin is over in America, like so. Yes. There is this massive national, you know, or international, I should say, transatlantic action in terms of labor, but it's almost like agriculture is stagnating at home. It, it's we're just swapping out one landlord or one large farmer for another kind of. Uh huh. Um, and that might well, be overstating it, <laughs> but yeah. the, the 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 workers' movement was all. Um, I think just how radical it was in this period and um, in Ireland is very much underappreciated, but yeah. it was also very much a minority movement. Yeah? yeah. And I also think we can look at the um, Irish revolution as like having a conservative outcome. Yeah. Um, 
Well, there's a massive uh, backlash against unions, kind of, and, and labor yeah. everywhere because after World War One of, of Russia, I suppose. Sure, you know? sure. Yeah. but I think the Irish Revolution having a conservative outcome, and a lot of this, like what I'm saying here, is that this thing that happened or that thing that happened was presaged uh, yeah. by a policy of the British state, and this is totally the case. But it, I think, it, it depends on what kind of time frame we we look at. It. Like, I think if you compare Lloyd George's Ireland mm. with Eamon Clare's Ireland, you're maybe not seeing that much difference. But if you go back to, say, the Viscount Palmerston's Ireland, which was the 1870s, and you look at it with a kind of a longer time frame, I think you would see a lot of difference. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Like, say if you compare 1870 with 1930, or the Ireland that was before the land war, yeah, mm. I think... If we want to think of, I think if we want to think of the Irish Revolution as a revolution, yeah, it had to have some kind of radical social change in it to be a revolution that actually happened as opposed to a potential revolution. But I think that radical social change was there if... If we widen the lens back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. If we, if, yeah. like, I mean, even with, like, um, all the... All the local government, every woman who was an MP, um, almost everyone who was an MP in, I'll just take Leash as an example, but it's it's true of other Irish counties, up till the 1870s was um, a, a landlord. That's who dominated the local government. That's who dominated the economic life. Yeah. And when you get to 1930, it's a different picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a big change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it also like it was a it, it it was a big it was a big change to in and in certain respects, it's what we looked back to now. What we might look back now with today's eyes to um, something that was very conservative and uh, and so on and so forth. Yes, that's that's mm -hmm. true. Also, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, this has been fascinating. As I say, it's it's not something that I'd ever, you know, kind of really thought about. And, and I never had looked at uh, certainly labor in terms of uh, the farm. So thank you so much, uh, Terry, Dr. Don, for being with us tonight. I should just give a quick reminder. We're live um, on Sunday or live. We're in person on Monday, I should say, sorry, with our um, film club. We're showing... Pure Grit, which is a documentary about um, Native Americans, which was filmed by an Irish person. And then on Tuesday, November 21st, we've got a conversation with Martin Nutty, who was the um, host of one of the Irish Stew podcasts. And uh, we have a few other talks this month. And then, of course, our Christmas market is coming up on December 2nd. So the rest of our talks are all online um, this month. We're just the only in person is our film club. So I want to thank you very much. When we get the book, I let everyone know that we have it. And, um, you know, this was fascinating. Oh, let's see that. Yeah, John says, terrific. Thanks, Jack. Uh, so we really appreciate you coming on. I know it's super late there, so I won't keep you anymore. But thank you very, very much. And um, we're delighted to hear from County Leash. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.